So good afternoon, folks. My name is Paul Martin, and I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I did in my career. Now, has anybody seen the 1401 demo this morning? Well, that was one of the things that I really love doing. I love doing it here. Yeah. I've learned that when Americans give speech, we are supposed to start by telling a joke. Well, I spent quite a bit of time in Japan in part of my career. One of the things that I learned in Japan is that a speaker always starts with an apology. So I'm going to pay homage to both uh, cultures. And I'm going to say, I humbly apologize to you for not starting this speech with a joke. My talk is about how I came to create Apple Dogs, Atari Basic, Commando Scene, digital cameras, and other things. So, my father, who was an electrical engineer and a geek, very much like me, once told me that you should do what you love, love what you do, and you will love your life. So, I've been following that advice. One of the things that we need to live that rule by is the kind of work I do. <laughs> so, basically, we have this concept. Beautiful thing when your career and your passion meet together. My passion is all computers. So my first job out of college was a place called the Applied Physics Laboratory in Howard County, Maryland. And I was hired to work in the computer center. And at my first leave frame was a monster. It's an IBM 360 Model 91. It was a supercomputer in the air, and basically the APL had probably half a dozen large mainframe computers. So my introduction was really in the largest mainframes available at the time, and I really enjoyed working with it. However, I was lured away from that job by an exciting job in California. And there was this thing called the Air Force Manned Orbital Laboratory. This thing is supposed to be a spy in the sky. This large thing was a satellite, a imaging satellite. It would be operated by two men for up to 40 days. And their taxi to the satellite and back was a Gemini space capsule. So basically, what I was interested in this job was involved space, which I was really interested in. And the job is located in California. I was wanted to come to California. So I was in California. My job was to work on an IBM 360 Model 95. It was to run the control center. And that computer was going to be located in the Blue Cube. Anybody remember the Blue Cube? It's gone now, but it was supposed to be there. Well, I worked there for like three months. And the project was canceled by the Air Force. So, it was an exciting job, but it didn't last very long. So I had to find another job. And I went to work for a division of IBM called the Service Bureau Company, IBM SBC. And the product I was working on was something called uh, Call 360. Call 360 was a nationwide time sharing system. And basically, you could use terminals to, over a telephone line, to program the basic PO1 and Fortran. Now, this job was very exciting. We got to learn to use process control, file systems, telecommunications, basic. I worked on there for eight years. I worked in virtually all aspects of the machine. However, while I was working on it, something very exciting came up. And that was microprocessors. Anybody remember this magazine? Well, when this came out, it was the Altair EA computer. And you could have your own computer in kit form for $4.95. Oops. 
So we have your computer in kit form. It was only at 495, and you know I looked at it and said, "Gee, I don't really want a computer, but I don't want that one just yet." So I was going to wait for something to come along. And while we were waiting for that, I was attending this thing called the Homebrew Computer Club. The gentleman standing in front, his name Gordon French. He was one of the originators of the Homebrew Computer Club. The man who took the picture, a man named Lee Feltenstein, he was the master of ceremonies at the Homebrew Computer Club, and uh, he's also known as the uh, designer of the, the uh, processor technology salt computer. Also in the audience here, see. In the audience here, here I am, sitting there with my finger in my eye. And right next to me is my lovely wife, here, Kathleen O'Brien, who happens to be in the audience. Kathleen, would you say hello? I'm going to be talking more about Kathleen later. She's played an important part in my career. So I was following the developments of computers, and in 1976, along came a computer that was just perfect for me. It was called the Kim One, and if you look at the features of the Kim One, it was those 245 hours. It wasn't a kit. It came all assembled, tested, and ready to run. And it came with a software monitor and, and ROM. And basically, it you know, was used to operate that keyboard. It was also used to operate the display. You could enter code in there and run programs and so forth. And uh, you could save programs to audio cassette, or you could read it into audio cassette. You could also hook it up to a TT1. So I bought one and started having fun with it. And the first bit of fun I had was I wire wrapped another 47k of memory. So now I have a total of 48k of memory. And I had a, a, a surplus terminal. So I had a really nice computer for very little money. Now what do you do with a computer like that? Well, I started having fun with the software. Now the 360 assembler or 360 assembly language, had a very nice macro processor. So I wrote a 6502 assembler in that macro processor. So I could write my 6502 code, macro code, it would create 6502 object code. What I would do is take that object code and put it into a call 360 user ID. And basically then I could download that code into my Kim one by calling into that user ID and running a program and downloading it. Then I could write it out to the set tape. So using that process, I wrote various assembly, assembly language utility programs. One being, since I was creating all this bad memory, I had to find a way to test it. So I wrote a utility program for testing. And then, I wrote a 6502 assembler and ran on the 6502. So I didn't have to go back to the IBM 360 to write my programs. And after that, I started to write a basic interpreter. Now, this was all going on while I was at SBC. However, it became time to leave SBC. And have you ever heard of a company called CDC, Control Data Corporation? Well, when I was working at SBC, IBM, CDC was the editor. Basically, they had brought a lawsuit against uh, IBM. And one day I came into work at SBC, they called us into a meeting. They said, guess what guys, now you're working for CDC. As part of the lawsuit settlement, IBM had given service bureau company to CDC. Now, if you can imagine, Say you work for Apple in the iPhone division. One day you come in, boss calls you into a meeting and says, Guess what? You're working for Microsoft. How do you think you would feel? Oh, that's the way I felt. 
Not only that, but there was a stipulation that none of us could go back to work for IBM for three years. So I was blocked out of IBM. And also I realized that personal computers were going to kill the type, type of uh, time sharing that SBC did. Basically, if you could do basic and a portrait on a personal computer, why would you need time sharing? So I didn't want to hang around SBC while I died. So I started looking at one ends. And I came up with a company called SMI, Shepherdson Microsystems Incorporated. And this was run by a guy named Bob Shepherdson. Bob was a real character. He was a lot of fun to work with. He was also kind of well known in the valley at the time. He had uh, created a settler for the M16. This was a national semiconductor. And under contract, he created the assembler for it. He had also written somewhere for 6502, Z80, and 6800. And he had created a basic for an unknown computer called the Astro 2000 and for a Mimco Z80. Now, he had contracted with Apple to create a basic for a product, a next generation Apple product, that was going to be called Apple Annie. Apple Annie was to be next generation. It was a 6502 machine, much like the Apple, but among other things, it was going to have program cartridges, like the Atari and the TI and so forth. The Apple Annie was supposed to have that. And I was hired to write the basic. So, let me tell you something about writing the basic at Shepard's I would write out my 6502 code on a, on a piece of paper, and we had a guy who would do a key punch, and he would key punch that code into bunch codes. I have no idea if you imagine um, basic being run at that time on punch cards. The code would get assembled on Chef's M16 cross assembly, and the output was paper tape. Now, how do you get paper tape into an Apple II? Well, there's a guy named Steve Wozner, if you've heard of him. Well, he came over and he created a card It was an interface between the paper tape reader and the Apple II. So basically, it would get read in. Now, I have a little footnote here about Apple Mini Basin. It became Atari Basin, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. So, now I'd like to transition to doing Apple Dolls. And when Boz was at Shepherdson setting up that tape reader, he was acting kind of depressed. And I asked him, what's wrong, Boz? And he told me he had developed a floppy disk drive for the Apple. He was really excited about that. He really loved the idea. However, his management had also asked him to get the hardware done as well as the software. The software being some kind of operating system. And he was just overwhelmed by the thought of doing that. He had called in Gary Kildall from um, DRI to get us some help, but it turned out to be not much help. So, while he was talking about this, talking about his schedule, I said, gee, I've done operating systems for IBM for eight years. I really knew how to do this. I knew just what needed to be done. So, uh, I volunteered to do the dogs. So, Chef and Jobs and Boss all got their heads together. They said, yeah, let's let him do that. So I volunteered to write it, and Chef and Boz and Jobs agreed. So Appalachia was put on, Appalachia Basic was put on hold. And I started working with the dogs with Boz. Now, part of the explanation that Boz was giving me is the way he designed this system. And this is a hand-drawn schematic by Waz. And you can see there's five small-scale integrated circuits yeah. on here. And if you looked at how anybody else did a DOS controller at the time, um, basically, 
with large cart at the top. Lots of ICs, you know, a lot of work, a lot of expense. What is at the bottom is what was created. It was very, very simple. And one of the reasons it was very simple was that he did most of the coding, all that stuff that was contained in that cart at the top, was being done in the microprocessor in the 6502 in the app. And so this is a listing of some of that code that runs the disk drive itself. And this part is called Rewrite Track Center. And it was actually handwritten out by Moaz and a guy named Randy Wigington. See, they hand wrote the code, they hand assembled it. And they entered it in a bite at a time and actually got it to work. It's quite amazing. So one of the first things I had to do when I took over was to send much cards. Now, because this was being run by the 6502, they counted on the one microsecond clock speed of the 6502. And the timing of the code was very critical. Part way down the page there, you can see a comment, must not pass page boundary. So this was a branch relative instruction. And on the 6502, a branch relative instruction, if the relative address was outside the page, it would add an extra cycle, and that would throw off the timing of the cycle, timing of the uh, um, code. So basically, yeah, you had to do it very precisely. So after a few days of teaching me about his design and telling me basically what happened, one, um, I started to uh, write the DOS and a contract was created. Now the basics of the contract was that it was uh, $13,000 for the job and the contract was signed on April 10th and it was signed by um, Boz, Jobs, and Chip. Over on the left there, you can see two little signatures. That's Boz and Jobs. And on the right is uh, Shepard's signature. And this called for delivery. And May 13, 1978. So they began working. And uh, I'd like to tell something about the design. Notice here there's something called a command interpreter. Well, the integer basic and the Applesoft basic, which was a basic Microsoft basic that was coerced into the Apple II by a guy named Randy Wigington. Uh, neither of those basics had DOS commands in them. So I had to create a command interpreter. This command interpreter would monitor every keystroke before it got to the basic. And it would look for things like open, close, read, write, and so forth. Look for commands. It would then take those commands and all the parameters and stuff it into this thing called a data control block. And it would put the command in there. And then the command interpreter would make a call to the file manager. The file manager would take that information and go access the disk, do whatever it needed to do. And you put data in a return code back in the data control block and then return to the command interpreter. Now, a result of say an open maybe, yeah, it's open ready to go, or it could be file non found, for example. So the command interpreter had fur messages that confirmed it. Now, also, if you notice on the right here, something that says assembly language program. When I designed this, I designed it so that assembly language programs could use the same data control block and use the same techniques. We're going to speak a little bit about that later. So, now it was an addition to the contract. In the original contract, uh, projected there would be an addition. So, on May 10th, three days before the DOS was due, we developed this additional contract. And the contract called for the relocation of DOS. What do we mean by that? Apples came in three flavors. 16K memory, 32K, 48K. Well, when you shipped the DOS, you had to assume they had a 16K machine. So the DOS was set up to load in 16K. But when it loaded, it would scan the memory, 
figure out how much memory there was and relocate itself up to high memory. That was quite a trick to do this because the 6502 was not designed to be relocatable. However, there was some help from Moz uh, had a disassembler in the uh, ROM code so that helped quite a bit. So, anyway, uh, the contract called for these cost relocation. And once it was relocated, I could send high memory right up to the beginning of DOS beyond all that relocation code. So the user could cover that relocation code space. Then another thing that they asked me to do was once it was relocated, create a boot test for that new DOS memory. And so the contract was $4,000. It was uh, going to take me 16 days. And so I set off to make more. And I got done on time, and the code was, source code was delivered to WAS by the end of June, or by the start of June. And uh, the object code was certainly delivered. And then what happened next was nothing from about DOS. Um, I resumed work on Basic, and Chet had hired my wife, Kathleen O'Brien, to help me with the Basic. And so, June, July, August, September, I really heard nothing from Apple about dogs. And then, one day in October, early October, Kathy and I were called to a meeting at Apple, and they were getting ready to release dogs, and they wanted me to fix a few bugs. So we had a discussion about um, which bugs I would fix and how I would fix them, and so forth and then how I would make the final delivery to them. And in the same meeting, we had some issues about the basic we were working on. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So, basically we agreed on what the final delivery was to be. And my final act with Apple Dots. I made the final delivery on October 6, 1978. The final delivery was in the form of a marked up listing. And this is an image of one of the pages of the marked up listing. And I did put the source code on a diskette, and I handed all this over to a guy named Dick Houston. And he took over the DOS, and I never touched it again. So that was my final line with the DOS. So, well, all those months while we were waiting, we were back working on, oh, one more thing. The, design of the, remember I said that there was this assembly language interface? Well, Apple never documented that. So it was there, it was to you. And I would ask, you know, can I document this? Can I write a book? He said no. So a little later, a guy named Don Worth came out with this book called Beneath Apple Dots. And basically, it explains how to use the bus from the assembly language which was a great help to anybody writing programs. Now, when you read the book, Don Worth claims that he disassembled this code and reversed engineered it to write this book. Now, that can't be true. He had to have had a list. And why do I say that? Because in this book, he used the names that he used in my list. Things like VTOC, Volume Table of Contents, IOS, MCB, IO Controller. So we had to have a list. We had all these run. So now, getting back to the Apple Any Basic. When we had this basic, there was no specifications whatsoever, other than a simple basic to fit in an 8K cartridge. Well, along came Jeff Raskins. He was hired as a technical writer, and he was assigned to write the manual for this simple basic. Well, he had some really great ideas on what basic should be. He wanted something that was rich and powerful. And so as he was writing the manual, he was writing a de facto specification. This thing was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He projected the size was going to be 32K. And well, it was really getting to be an outlandish basic. Jeff actually called it not so basic. We at Shepherdson had a different name for it. We call it nuts and basic. 
So, you know, remember in that October meeting, um, Nebraska was, was writing a de facto specification. We started complaining about this. Basically, this is not what we contracted for. It's not a simple basin. It's not to be fake in an 8K cartridge. And so we asked, what do you really want? Um, you know, and who at Apple was responsible for it? Well, what we found out was, no one at Apple was responsible for it. So basically, we said, well, you know, make somebody responsible. So, so Apple told us they would fix the problem. And Apple hired this guy named John Couch from HP to be the software VP. And so John fixed the problem. He canceled the project, which was fortuitous for Shepardson because of Atari. In 78, Atari was working on the Atari 400 800. They were called the Colleen and the Candy uh, internally. And they had planned to use Microsoft 6502 base. Well, by the summer of 78, their Microsoft basic was 12K, and it was too big to fit in the cartridge. And it wasn't working, and they wanted to be able to show it for CES. So they came to Shepherdson asking for help. And the help we offered them was we would create an entire new basic for you. Not only that, we would write the file management system for your disk drive. So after much conversation back and forth, Atari agreed in October 1978 for us to start this project. So we wrote a contract. The contract called for delivery of April 6, 1979. And basically, we cleverly added a uh, clause for bonuses. If it came in early, we'd get $1,000 a week. If it came in late, it'd be $1,000 a week penalty. And I'll tell you why it was clever in just a second. So basically, we started working on basic and was clever because I took Appalachian Basic and transformed it to Atari Basic. And we'd already had three, four months worth of work done. And by the way, the contract with Apple didn't prevent this. So, all legit. So, now the development for Atari Basic was done solely on the Apple II. And then we started working, talking about the Basic itself. This was a tokenized basin. What this meant was, if you had a command like print, we would transform it into a token, a one byte token, or a command like if, and so forth. And if you had a variable, we transformed that into a three byte token. One byte that said it was a variable, and two byte ultimate displacement of a variable tape, and operators and so forth got transformed to tokens. Another thing we did is transform, most people would write an infix notation, that would be like A plus B. We transform that to something called postfix, or reverse Polish, where it becomes B or A, B plus, because you're reading along the code. And what that meant was you take A, push it on the stack, you take B, push it on the stack, find the operator. Pull the values off, add them together, put them back on the stack. This made it possible to execute the code in a linear fashion. So everything was tokenized. Now, one result of this was I didn't retain the source text. So what you wrote is not what you got. When you did a listing, you would regenerate the source text. And so your spacing was not there, and your the way you wrote the expression may look a little bit different than the way it was spoken. It just saved a lot of space for the code. And another thing we did was most basics at the time had integral binary basic. And you may know that binary basic is not too good with exact numbers. For example, in dollars and cents. So we're doing dollars and cents with um, binary floating. Get the wrong 
answer a lot of times in dollars and cents. So we did investment funding, and Kathleen was the creator of the investment funding. Um, also, um, uh, at the dollars that was well integrated and had all the commands we needed. We didn't have to do this funny stuff of um, intercepting these terms. We also uh, interfaced. Atari had a very rich sound of commands and graphics. And they also had metal command. So this was all integrated into the base. Now, talking about the Atari numbers, uh, I call it the FMS, meaning File Management System. It really wasn't a DOS, it was a File Management System. And, of course, this was a modified Apple DOS. And one of the modifications needed was um, the Atari had 128 byte sectors, where the Apple DOS had 256 byte sectors. Now, the Atari did not have a read write track sector. They had a piece of code called CIO. And so if you want to read to write to a disk, it would be called the CIO. So since I was developing on an Apple, I had to emulate this CIO program. And so I wrote the entire FMS using the Apple disk drives and Apple DOS for Apple read write track sector. So Using this technique of developing on the app, when I took my code over to Atari to run for the first time on an Atari 800 prototype, it worked the very first time. So, developing on the app really came in. So, given that I did delivered the basic and the internal FMS to them on December 22nd, 1978, that was 12 full weeks early. It was in time for the CES. So, basically, 12 weeks early, $12,000 bonus. Very nice. I told you we were being very good. Now, again, the way Atari Basic was sold was on this 8 bay cartridge, and it came with an interesting manual. Kathy and I kind of made a joke on that. It started off with something like, gee, my Atari is really lucky. It's got a basic cartridge. It's kind of silly. Um, this was the way the FMS was sold. And we had one other product that we developed at Shepherds on the Atari. It was the Atari Assembler Editor. And basically, this was a cartridge. And anybody ever used the Assembler Editor? Well, that assembler editor was written by my wife. As I know, right? She did three or four about her. So, and as a result of the basic project, or Atari projects, I ended up co authoring two books. There's one called Inside Atari Games. And basically, it had a listing of the Atari DOS, and it uh, was a detailed explanation of how that DOS worked. But again, this was permitted by our contract. And I also co authored a book called the Atari Basic Source Book. Once again, this had the entire listing of the Atari Basic and a detailed explanation of how that um, basic worked. And by the way, while working on the uh, basic or the books, this was a picture taken. And you can see over my shoulder there. There's an Apple II system. There's two disk drives there. Those two disk drives were serial number three and four. Waz got serial number two. There was a problem in manufacturing, so serial number one was never created. So this is very early disk drives. And another thing, I did a lot of other things at Shepherds. One thing I was proud of was writing the compiler, C compiler. For the uh, Ferment Pro C. And when I started this, I had no knowledge of how they did C. I never looked at C before. So I got turned again to Richie's book and uh, started learning all about C. And I ended up writing C in C using Whitesmith C on a PDP 11. So I'm kind of proud of this book. 
Over time, Shepard said he was getting, losing interest in the business. And as a result, Kathleen had gone back to SPC. And remember I said, do what you love, love what you're doing, et cetera. Well, who wouldn't have him in the front of the semi and So, fortunately for me, Atari made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Um, I, he offered me a manager's job, and uh, so I decided to enter the management track and became the manager assistant software at Atari. So, what happened? I was actually hired to work on a project called Sweet 16. Sweet 16 was to be the next generation of the Atari 408. My job was to manage the system software development. And I was also part of the Sweet 16 development team. Now, some interesting stories came out of the development. Marketing decided that the Sweet 16 had to have a help team. Well, there was no programs written for Atari that knew what a help team was. But since I was doing the system software, we had to have something happen when you press the help key. So, if you weren't running any programs, you pressed the help key, and what happened was we did a self test. Just a second, I need to get And the self test would test the screen by putting up, putting up some graphics on the screen and you can compare and see that you got the right stuff. It would test memory, and the way it tested memory was it would put up an array of blocks on the screen. As it tested each memory, it would change color depending on whether it passed or failed. And we would test the sound. Now, to test the sound, we needed to play something, some music. So the programmer said, What should we play? We got our heads together. Remember uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind in that five note sequence? Anyway, I just played that five note sequence. So, um, what happened was, the market had heard that, they said, you can't use that. It dates the computer. So, basically, they would often they contract somebody to create an Atari theme song. There's an interesting story about that. The guys that they contracted with, they didn't write a very good contract. They didn't get the rights to put their own. We didn't find out about that until we had started selling ones. So that company came back and said, hey, Atari, you know, it was a royalty for the system. So, interesting market. Um, the other thing we did was a keyboard test. And basically, uh, the keyboard, they put an image of the keyboard. And the user would press the keys. And as he pressed the keys, they would light up. Well, if nobody pressed the keys after a while, we could press the keys for them. If we were pressing those keys for them, we had to type something. So I told the program to type his name. So if you had an early Atari 800, you look at that self test, it spelled out the word Michael Colbert. It was the program And the result of the project was the Atari 1200XL. I thought it was a beautiful system. I mean, the industrial design was beautiful. It had a beautiful system software for the cell test. However, for some reason, the Atari community thought it was immense. It's kind of disappointing. Now, Atari was in trouble. If anybody remembers what Atari was like back then, um, it was obviously declining. I was offered a job at Fox Video Games. This is 20th Century Fox. And what they wanted to do was going to be the director of software development. And what we were supposed to do was create game development as an engineering task. Game developers up to that point had been one little guy who developed the game, he did the graphics, he did the sound, he did it all by himself. What we were going to do was have other people uh, working on it, and uh, basically we have somebody game designing, somebody else doing the graphic, somebody else doing the sound, and we were going to do uh, 
one game for many machines, many machines, the entire game, console, Atari 400, 800, um, EI, and so forth. Uh, and the game's going to be based on box properties, which are games like Fast Eddie, Courtney's, Alien, The Mash, and so forth. And it was turning along, however, the games were not selling very well. And one day, Fox, 20th Century Fox said, you're done. We spent $18 million on your nonprofit. So they shut us down. And so I had to go find a new job. And I ended up in a company called Logitech as director of software development. And my guys worked on the software for handheld scanners, mice, trackballs, and there's one product that you probably heard about talking about. That's this thing called Photobit. It's a digital camera. It was created by Dyke, company called Dyke. And they offered it to us. We paid a big price for it. And it's a camera that created 32 grayscale images that you download via serial port to your own computer. So we bought the rights to it. Ended up making and manufacturing theirs was not. And we did uh, theirs was a their camera was black, unmanufacturable, their camera was black, manufacturable. And my job was to create the Mac PC software for them. So what happened next was Logitech reorganized. And they reorganized into business units. Rather than uh, functional units, functional units being software engineering, hardware engineering, marketing, and so forth. A business unit would have its own little hardware engineering, software, and so forth. So I became the director of camera development. And as the director of camera development, I was given a task to make the uh, photo man into a color camera. So, how do you make a black and white camera into a color camera? Well, basically, you see here these, uh, these gray things at the bottom are image sensors. To make it a color camera, you overlay a matrix of color filters. And there was one particular pattern called the Bayer's pattern. This was created by a guy named Bryce Bayer's. Credited working for Kodak in 1976. It's basically a repeating pattern of two by two. You have two green filters, a red filter, and a blue filter. This is what virtually all digital cameras use today for color images. And now to take this raw image and create it into a useful color image, there's a process called the mosaic. And Basically, there's many ways of doing this. Now, if you buy a camera, they have their own deal. Team A, team B, yeah, that part. Into the uh, your images. However, they also give you a raw image in case you have your own e mosaic filters. Now, the photo man color used a TV uh, image sensor, and there was no TV image sensor using this virus pattern. It's a pattern of cyan, yellow, green, magenta. Well, we had to create our own the mosaic algorithms. And our process, process, progress on that was not very good. So they ended up contracting with Kodak for a color camera. And the color camera was 512 by 768 pixels. It used the Bayer pattern. Have 48 images. So, doing this, my team developed a complete set of specifications. We developed specifications for everything, like drop tests, and, uh, um, moisture sensitivity, just all sorts of things. It turns out that Kodak was also working with Apple to develop something called the Quick Tape. Which basically had the same specifications, but Apple was not given those specifications. Kodak said it was like pulling teeth to get 
get happy and tell them what they want. So they were very happy that I had a nice set of specifications. And I developed a uh, industrial design. And this is what it looked like. It was kind of a binocular camera. And so uh, we named this product the Photoman Return. And I was coordinating development between Logitech, who we were doing the software and the marketing course, and Kodak, which was doing the uh, um, engineering research, and a company called Shinon, which was doing the manufacturing in Japan. As a result of this, I ended up spending a lot of time in Japan. And when you spend time in Japan on business, you end up going out to a lot of dinners. A lot of air and a lot of sight. Interesting times. Now, the work was going very, very smoothly until one day my management said, We can't afford this project anymore. We want you to cancel it. So, I had a very interesting meeting with Coda. And they went off and I figured we were done. They came back a few days later with a proposal. Um, their proposal was. They wanted to sell this camera too. They would sell it under the label DC40. And uh, so we would sell it under Victoria, and they would sell it under DC40. They said, Logitech, you don't have to pay anymore for the development of it. And uh, they also said that they would pay us a royalty for every DC40 sold. And they said they wanted me to continue managing the project. So Logitech agreed. And uh, basically, we continued development, and this became the Kodak DC40. And here's a picture of the two of them together. The one on the right is the Futura, the one on the left is the DC40. Now, basically, Kodak sold a lot more of these cameras than we did because they were selling it cheaper. They also uh, Put a lot more effort into marketing. And what was interesting is Kodak sent those royalty checks directly to me. They didn't have my name on it, unfortunately, but uh, they sent them to me. So I was kind of watching how much Kodak was actually making. And in the end, the royalties we got from Kodak more than paid for the development costs. And, uh, and of course, we made money. Now, I ended up, eventually I retired, and if you've ever been a programmer and you retired, you got this itch that you want to scratch, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? So, I just decided to write a basic for Android, and it was my retirement project. And I first introduced it in December 2010, and uh, basically, I continued updating it every week. Continuously improving. And in 2013, since it was open source, I opened it up to the user development community. So now I have a community of developers working on this. And uh, right now it touches just about every API and, uh, and Android. So if you want to program an Android, you can do it in basic and do just about everything. And as part of it, um, I created a, I didn't create, but the team ended up creating a 238-page manual. It tells how everything is done. It's a very nice manual, full of graphics and explanation, and so forth. Today, there's 97,000 downloads, almost 100,000 here. And it's got a 4.5 or a 5 rating. So if you happen to have an Android, Go on, uh, on Google Play, look up basic, it's the first one you see. And this is what it looks like. So, getting back to doing what you love, love what you do, you love your life. So that's what I've done all my life, as you can tell. Today, besides the Android basic, today what I love doing is bringing computer history to life. I'm a docent here at the museum, you can tell, and I really love telling people about computer history. Also love demonstrating the 14th. So, if you 
want to contact me, this is my email address, paulmhunt.com, and you can find an enhanced version of these slides at this internet address on my website. Thank you. So does anybody have any questions? No questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't actually know for sure, but every time I made an update to the code, I would change a counter in the listing. And I think that was the counter point at that time. Did you deliver to Apple a 1.0? No. Because I never saw a 1.0 or a 1.0 or a 1.0. What I delivered to them was a marked up listing. And I don't know what the number on that was. So what happened, they ended up calling a 3.0. That's probably something internal to happen. Right. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Back to the point we were talking about, how the games were generally developed by one single program. Atari time. Yes. Uh, and then you said that you started taking over as a project manager managing a development team. I mean, at, at that time, uh, did you have any interesting experiences trying to manage a whole group rather than one? You know, was that a new experience for you, or was that you know managing a group of developers rather than one developer doing everything? No, basically, most of the, when I came on, was that one guy doing all the work. And so all those guys got turned into uh, game developers. So they were free to develop the game. And we can add resources to them to do the graphics and so forth. So they kind of like the idea. Any more questions? No more questions? Yes, Daniel. He just gave you rewrite track sector. That, that was the one routine that he had created, right? Exactly. It was the only code I got from Waz, and it was in that handwritten form. I also got uh, you know, explanations of how everything worked, but that was it. So, what can I say? Any more questions? Okay. Measure